there was no question of hitting rough waters for me because I I never wanted to do this. It was never my journey. It was never my calling. Till my in-laws told me that you have to do something in life. There was another thing that happened at that point in time. If you ever thought about putting your brand out there, mm. getting the right PR, mm. people looked at you and said, "Oh, so you want to do PR, which means you don't know your work." Mm. It was yeah. like a taboo. I went to meet uh, uh, late Mr. Yash Chopra for uh, Lamey. Mm. He called Shree Devi and said, "You don't know suit book me at all. You don't know anything. Be so strong in your product mm. and your knowledge of the product mm. that you can come to see." Despite being such a rich craft story, uh, why is it that we don't yet have a brand like you to talk from? So uh, your question can be demarcated into two because number one, as someone deeply passionate about the rich Indian craft heritage, I often wonder why, as a nation, we have failed to build an aspirational luxury handcrafted Make in India brand. much like the louis vuittons of the world my guest today is an indian costume designer and fashion stylist who has worked in over 400 films both bollywood and hollywood she is a four time national award winner and a member of the academy of motion picture arts and sciences in this episode with the fashion entrepreneur neeta lulla i was in awe of her energy her journey her attitude her charisma her observations of how fashion has evolved and so much that she shared now let's hear what this cxo talks thank you for being on cxo talks neeta just to have you and just to have you here and being in your presence makes me feel so centered and so much in control thank you for having me here i've heard so much about This entire series that you've done, I think this is your thirtieth or thirty-first, yes. and uh, it amazes me how you keep going. And I'm happy to be part of it. Yes, thank you so much for making time. Um, and as a designer who's already done more than three eighty films, uh, who's worked with almost hundred stars in Bollywood and so many more, and continues to be so engaged in doing so much for so many other clients. I know that this can be very busy. This can be very hectic, especially this time of the season. Uh, but yet here you are, and for my audience at CXO Talks, I know that your journey has been a very long journey. You've had your own stints with um, failing first, learning from them, and just rising, uh, and that's admirable. I would want to kickstart this conversation by knowing about that moment. Uh, you know, I want to take the deep moment first, uh, hit the rough waters first, and understand from you that Neeta back then when she started off. So, um, because you said hit the back waters and rough waters, there was never rough waters. Mm. Um, you know uh, the perception generally is that uh, there are rough periods and there are um downs that people come out of mm. and stuff like that um more so in today's times mm. you know i would say because there's so much going on out there there is so many aspirations so many dreams that uh, are part of every individual's journey to make it to the top that you have a very thought about set organized plan that by this year i want to be doing this and by this year i want to have so many people working under me and we never had that mm. we never came from that uh, genre and uh, there was no question of hitting rough waters for me because i i never wanted to do this it was never my journey it was never my calling till my in-laws told me that you have to do something in life mm-hmm. and i happened to do this film that i did and for the first time someone fired me yeah for the shoddy work i did and to my uh, my knowledge with my knowledge it was not shoddy work it was designing with mainstream techniques mm. that didn't work for film costuming and uh, of course it was not about hitting ground zero that day but it was about getting fired and realizing that i don't know that particular thing mm. which kind of instigated me and inspired me to work through the night 
understand the technique, write that wrong and go back to shoot the next day with a perfect garment. Hmm. So, um, yeah, I mean, that was that was something that I took in my stride. And considering that kind of a, a mindset that I had, and I've always been, I take these things in my stride. I mean, there are, there are times that, you know, um, in, in these words of rock bottom, everybody sees this kind of a situation. Mm. But uh, one has to just rise like the phoenix. Absolutely. You know, we all uh, dream about. Yeah. And we just have to put that into process and yeah. get on with it. Yeah. And you need to kind of forget that mm. and just move forward. Mm. And um, by grace of God, this is something that I kind of do in my yeah. life. I want to understand this aspect um, and definitely for the audience, the fact that as a designer, times were very different back then when you started, times were very different now. Uh, there's so many references, there's so much to look up to and the, it's a very democratic place. What were the ways that you functioned to create that exposure for yourself, especially considering that you were very enterprising to begin at that point in time, even if it came um, as as a push from your in-laws to start something of your own. But uh, what were the ways that you exposed yourself beyond the education to learn the nuances of design? So, uh, essentially, thank God for the democratic space we are in. Yeah. Okay, and that can be, it uh, can be a plus and that can be a pitfall. Mm. But uh, it's up to you how you kind of uh, take it and you move forward. Um, of course, the push came for, to me from my in-laws, but then when I started uh, working, yeah. you know, um, today's work format and work culture is very different from back then. Mm. Um, back then, you were a designer, you were an accountant, you were a fabric merchandiser, you were a, um, you were your own PR person, your own mm. marketing person. There are times when I've gone to my own studio or done jharu because there was nobody to do it and move things and you know get the store ready and stuff like that and that's how we we kind of came about mm. i would say the initiation of fashion happened very very um briefly the twist with fashion happened for a lot of people as a tailoring format back in the 60s and i remember the college that i studied from uh, SNDT university yeah only started because they wanted to empower mm. um, women who had lost their husbands or whatever in back in the 50s, just to give you a small backstory. And then slowly, gradually, in the 60s, people started taking it up as a tailoring. 70s, a little more, uh, you know, conceptualization of fashion mm. happened because people were suddenly hearing about brands. Mm. And 75, 78, I think, Heyman came on the scene in mm. SNDT and started teaching fashion. And I took up fashion under his guidance in SNDT in 84, 85, when I graduated mm. in 86. So, um, essentially, at that point in time, you didn't have a lot of demarcation of vocations within the industry mm -hmm. you had a lot of uh, you had to do everything mm -hmm. because you were just about testing waters and that's how it started and uh, thank god for that actually yeah. because i learned everything yeah. you know and then as soon as i graduated in 86 um, i was taken up by Hemant as his apprentice to mm -hmm. kind of work with him on fashion shows with Jeannie Naroji. Mm -hmm. And my calling was never fashion, it was fashion choreography. Mm -hmm. And the two years and the 21 shows that I did at that point in time, and I always aspired to be a fashion choreographer. Yeah. They say, you know, when you look at look up to your guru, then yeah. that's what you aspire to be. Yeah. And I was always aspiring to be a fashion choreographer. And uh, there... The inception of choreography, the the uh, advent to the kind of work that happened at mm. that point in time kind of gave me the awareness of what was happening internationally as well because mm. Heyman was traveling. Jeannie, who I worked with, knew a lot about because she met with a lot of international clients. We knew what was going on outside the country, mm. which normally uh, back then with two biannual magazines, we never had clue of yeah. what was going on. And... 
I started learning a lot about that with the uh, choreography. I started learning about how people stand, walk, talk. We were training models. Um, she used to ask me to pick up, select garments, give me themes, select garments, uh, put jewelry together. If you don't, you, if you can't find jewelry, make it yourself. Mm -hmm. So I used to that make hands -on. jewelry that hands-on. If the dress doesn't look uh, right, tighten it, mm. cut it, alter it shape it mm. so that gave a lot of uh, uh, understanding about you know how fabrics or how outfits have to be draped for various mm. looks so i guess that is what kind of helped me mm. hands on apart from the education in fashion yeah and um, yeah that's where it is at today and have things changed now or, or people are still that hands on when it comes to no today things are very different there was another thing that happened at that point in time if you ever thought about putting your brand out there mm. and getting the right pr mm. people looked at you and said Achha, so you want to do pr which means you don't know your work mm. it was yeah. like a taboo yeah you cannot do pr mm. today you can't work without pr yeah and marketing so yeah that is the difference there's a huge diametrical shift yeah. in you know the dimensions of the way you worked yeah. and that's pretty much what happened and uh, today it's a completely different ball game altogether but thank god for my hands on um, experiences yeah. that today even if i'm standing in in and it's happened it's not like once but most of the time it happens that even on a set mm -hmm. If I'm standing there and they need something, mm. I can cook it up on the set in half an hour, 45 mm. minutes and I've done it. Mm. Or even with a, with a bride, yeah. you know, um, if she needs something and I see and it's not correct, I can kind of just tack it or hem it or yeah. cut it and put it in place. Yeah. Without any hesitation, Without just be very handy. Yeah, I, do, I don't need to say, oh, tailor ko bulao, yeah. I can't do it. Yeah. That, that doesn't happen. Is that one thing that you feel that the current generation of designers can take in as an attitude or is there something else as well? I don't know. I mean, to each their own. Mm. And uh, I just feel that education gives you a very firm grounding. And uh, if you've got that basis, mm. because I would have never been where I am had I not been able to have that education of um, cuts. Mm -hmm. It became easy for me to understand costume cutting. But if I didn't have that knowledge, mm. I would have never known how a costume is cut. Mm. So um, it was just like going from uh, 11th standard to 12th standard. Mm. It's a graduation course. Mm. And I think for every designer, it's important that <clears throat> your technique is there. And mm. it's you, you've kind of got a firm grounding mm. of that because without that, mm. You at some point you get stagnant. Yeah. So uh, you know, take me back to that time. You talked. You did talk about uh, touch upon the failure that happened early on, um, and how the very next day you ensured that things were taken care of. You were very steady, very hands on. Uh, but the next film, and the next film, and the next film. What were the things? Uh, you know, what were some of those significant movies that you feel that really helped you also understand that this is possibly my thing and this is what i love as a style this is the kind of weave that i want to continue working with what were those things and moments in your journey that made you discover your love for weaves especially so um i don't think i like i said i had a calling for all this mm. but i went with the flow and I just took on whatever work. Mm. I'm a very greedy, creative person, mm. let me tell you. I just want to work all the time. If I can get the more, the merrier. Mm. Today, right now, as we speak, I'm doing three films together simultaneously. Mm. And the high that it gives me is something else. Plus working on bridles, plus working on my shows, plus working on um, my social media uh, mm. format and everything. So everything together, and I won't have it any other way. I will never sit and say, oh, I'm so tired. I can mm. never do it because mm. that's not me. Mm. But uh, um, every film that I got, I just took it on as a challenge and I just went with the flow. Mm. I mean, my first ever film, uh, Tamacha, was a huge film, if you see. It was with Rajni Kansar. Yeah. 
and Jitu ji and Kimi Katkar mm. and Amrita Singh mm. and Bhanu Priya and yeah. I was working with Bhanu Priya and Kimi Katkar at that point mm. in time. Then suddenly after the film released, I got Sri Devi's call and I got Juhi to style for and uh, two, three other actors. Mm. And that point in time, we had no luxury of phone calls. We had no yes. luxury of assistance. In fact, I was the one who started taking assistance on uh -huh. with my uh, my project Devdas. That was the oh. first time any designer had, had an assistant, had four assistants. Because I was doing all the ladies in the film. So yeah, and um, I still wonder without any um, insta uh, with, without any uh, mobiles, without any Assistance, how did I manage to do at least 250, 260 films at that point in time? Wow. It was just that we used to organize, work, do this, finish, next project, finish, next. It was just that. Yeah. So who had the time to actually sit and plan and want to have a calling or want to have, uh, you know, uh, thinking about what you want to do next mm. and how you want to do it. So that was never there. Mm. And in this process, uh, you know, whether it was Devdas, whether it was uh, Jodhap, uh, whether there were so many other movies that you worked on and you worked with some of the most phenomenal stars in the industry. Uh, and I would want to draw a parallel in an agency business for that matter. You know, when we are working with clients, it is again a creative field. Uh, from a client end, there's so much input that comes in yet you as somebody who's a creative knows the vision knows what you want to enhance what you want to amplify what you want to probably tone down so what were such moments and how do you deal with that kind of uh, a negotiation so to say i never negotiated mm -hmm. because um you know there's there's an aspect of trust mm. Like when you go to your jeweler, you'll go to a particular jeweler because you have the trust. Mm. In the same way, at that point in time, films and costuming mm. were kind of coming of age. So we had Xerxes Batena, who was an educated costume designer. Himant was there, Mickey. We were like a group. Mm. And, and um, when I met with the actors, the only thing I had to fall back on was my confidence of understanding structure, understanding techniques and and if I found that a particular actor was going wrong, you know, I would just explain what was right mm. and what would be looking right visually by the basic factor of technique. Mm. And they understood that. I mean, you need to have that conversation. Yeah to kind of touch here and here. Hmm. You can't just touch here and say, okay, you look beautiful. No, yeah. it has to be something that they understand that then you know your technique and hmm. then the trust factor comes hmm. in. And so, that's how I kind of dealt with them with hmm. a great deal of honesty. And I've never worked against characterization first hmm. and then glamour. Mm. I must have lost three, four films because of the fact that I didn't adhere only to glamour. Because mm -hmm. there were certain actors who said, oh, you don't want to just go glamour because I want to just look glamorous. Forget the character. Mm -hmm. And I never worked with that. So I remember there was this instance uh, when, uh, possibly during Devdas, when uh, Sanjay Leela Bansali uh, probably said that oh, she wears Western, would she understand uh, yes. the Indian <laughs> attire that and the whole <laughs> Bansali sets being Bansali sets, the kind of production they are. Uh, how did you manage that? Because but that even happened at uh, when I was doing, uh, when I was, I went to meet uh, um, late Mr. Yash Chopra for uh, Lame. Mm. He called Sri Devi and said, he comes to suit and he doesn't know anything. So <laughs> that was my first twist with this kind of a thing. And uh, yeah, then when they saw my work, I was I was the one go to. Mm. Because then from Chani Lamhe to Dar to Aina to his films, yeah. post that, couple of his mm. films post that as mm. well. So when entrepreneurs or when uh, creatives come into such a situation, mm. 
where they probably are very confident about their techniques and their understanding of the nuances of their field yet um feel they're unable to create that confidence to the client in front of them or the potential uh partnership that is standing right in front of them what in your journey have been those learnings that you would want to probably share uh can they apply in their journeys my question to your question would be a question why because hmm be so strong in your product hmm and your knowledge of the product hmm that you can convince the other person i don't see why you can't do that hmm so as a designer apart from films hmm there is a very difficult aspect in my journey that i handle and hmm. that is creating clothes for a bride mm mm-hmm. do you know how many people come with a bride it's an entourage that comes yeah I mean the father the mother the sister the aunt and the everybody mother in law the father in law sometimes and we have 11 people at at one go at times and then you have this bride sitting there and she has her own dream thought process and the groom wants her to look another way and mm. the father wants her to look another way you know then you are listening to 11 perspectives of glamour and fashion which is sometimes like you know Yeah. and sometimes you really need to take that into consideration yeah and then you're looking at the bride and and she's like you have to make out what she is trying to convey convey and not by wanting to convey but by the expression mm. and then you need to come up with something that she really loves the the family loves it mm. and then it has to stay there for with her for posterity to be able to be reusable and rewearable so that's that's a tight rope walk mm. and you cannot accomplish this mm. believe me without your knowledge mm. and people listen to you yeah when you come with that kind of a command of your knowledge people definitely listen to you um indeed yet design is a very uh, very dynamic very like evolving like as we talk there are changes happening fast fashion has become a thing uh and there's also an angle of sustainability now there's so much that is happening uh again for me i would want this to come out as a learning for entrepreneurs creatives alike but how have you because you've paced through multiple decades here and you've seen a lot change uh and change in ways that it's it's drastic uh from where when you started to now how do people stay tuned to these changes how do you evolve uh what have been your tools to stay very aligned with what's happening and not get rigid about what you know is right so you just made me sound like a dinosaur but i am like over here 16 yes and that yes and is, yes that is what makes me stay tuned so mm. um what i mean to say is that you mm. need to keep your perspectives open mm. you can't kind of uh, uh, sit back and say i arrived and achieved in my days you can't do that mm. when you're speaking to a 15 year old you need to speak the same language mm. when you're speaking to an 80 year old you need to speak the same language mm. you need to keep your eyes and ears and mind open mm. you need to keep your heart open to pick to grasp mm. and um i feel we're learning every day yeah every day is a learning process for mm. me 40 years down today and uh, actually 400 films down mm. i still I'm talking about films and I'm getting goosebumps and yeah. I'm talking about my work. So yeah. that's how connected I am with work yeah. and that's how connected I am with people around me mm. who are kind of working doing well and you know like hungry students and aspirants who are constantly seeing what's new what's happening yeah. what's I do the same. Yeah. I mean I can't say that I'm not doing that mm. because in our early years our inspirations go to was the library mm. which thank god we did 
Hmm. And uh, then looking at people, looking at film stars, pop actors, you know, emulating them. We did all that and we got our inspirations. Today, the medium has changed apart from the library and your pop artists. And yeah. we, we have the social media, we have digital mediums. Mm -hmm. So one gets to see, I mean, even if you are sitting in Mumbai, what's happening in Paris, yeah. you know, in like two seconds. Mm -hmm. So that makes it easier for you to be aware. Mm. And also the fact that I teach, I teach fashion. I've mm. been teaching for the last 36 mm. years. Um, I think apart from me being able to give back to the fraternity, it's a God gift because I'm speaking to young minds every year after year. Yeah. There is a ch change in perception. Yeah, There's a change in thought process. So that really helps. Mm. And speaking about sustainability, I think post COVID, a lot of people introspected on what is good for them, what is bad for them, mm. what is good for the society. And people started picking up uh, on sustainable fabrics, on uh, uh, trying to protect the ozone layer and, and a whole lot of things. There has been a major awareness. Yeah. But uh, coming to us Indians, we've always been sustainable. Mm -hmm. I mean, with the fact that we want our parents, um, grandmoms, our moms, hand-me-downs. We want, uh, for a single aspect, like it was a very funny quote actually from Gaur Gopal Dasji, which has resonated with me. Mm -hmm. He says, we as Indians are a very thriving society and culture mm -hmm. because you buy a t-shirt and you wear it. Often you wash it and you yeah. wear it because it becomes your best t-shirt. And if there's a hole in it, mm. you wear it for holy. Mm. And if this still becomes bad, then you take it and you use it as jarukat kind or you pota in your house. Yeah. So, I mean, in that aspect, we all yeah. are sustainable, yeah. you know, and uh, we just need to get a little more sustainable. Um, more so, we are not the kinds who keep buying and buying and buying clothes and then throwing it every season. Mm. You know, that's happened now. The culture has changed now. Mm. Where we're kind of aping what we mm. see around. We was, everyone's going for a Zara sale. Everyone's going for this sale and that sale and picking up clothes mm. or just picking up clothes because it's the new season mm. um, look. Yeah. But we never did that earlier. Mm. So that is kind of changing. So to me, to that aspect has become a circular economy of sorts. Mm. Yes. That's also uh, the other aspect that you see is also because that's being marketed to us. Yes. Being pushed our way. Yeah. Um, we talked about sustainability and with that what also came to my mind was the fact that while sustainability has become a word now, uh, you in your space, especially somebody who's been pure leading design in India, have always worked on weaves. That's one thing that's very close to your heart. And uh, for me, that's uh, also something that resonates a lot with me because back in 2016, I became very passionate about the work that artisans in our country do. So rich, so time-taking. Uh, the conditions that they do it in and they continue to take the craft forward. Uh, and Pethany being one of the crafts that I got to know about uh, after the Make in India initiative, uh, which you were spearleading. I would want to understand, Neeta, from you that while we look at the global handicraft uh, story, there are brands like Louis Vuitton, which, you know, when you think about a handcrafted Louis Vuitton bag, people are willing to, you know, just sell a kidney and get the bag. But... Uh, when it comes to India, despite being such a rich craft story, uh, why is it that we don't yet have a brand like Louis Vuitton from India? So uh, your question can be demarcated into two because number one, a sustainable aspect. Uh, today, we are speaking a lot about sustainability, but sustainability is not constricted to just fabrics. Mm. Um, as a designer, I have been sustainable from 1986, which was my first bridal outfit that yeah. I did. Um, because the endeavor has always been to see how that outfit could be reused in different ways mm -hmm. from my first outfit. Mm. And that is the case even today. Mm. 
um, so sustainability for me as a designer started back then. Mm. Um, fabrics, uh, there are sustainable fabrics. Uh, uh, we've always been dappling with crafts and weaves. Um, I've always worked with Paithani for yeah. the longest time and Kalamkari. Now, Kalamkari is an art that um, is actually known as Sri Kala Kalamkari, which is done on very organic cotton mm. fabric with um, organic animal, dyes. Uh, with yeah. the vegetable dyes yeah. and cow dung and yeah. different kinds of oils. Yeah. So that's another aspect of sustainability. And that's a craft that is very soon dying. Mm. Because the original um, craftsmanship are not being able to sustain their generation going ahead and not wanting to. They've taken mm. a white collar job because that gives you more money. Mm. Coming to the second part of your question, mm. um, our uh, artisans and weavers, um, though we as Indians and as spear leaders, uh, spearheading um, a particular mm. format of work, try to bring the awareness. The awareness is not just enough. Mm. because um, there is a question of educating them there mm. is a question of further empowering them which is required mm. um, because if you see a weaver is going to weave two saris of the same kind in 15 days yeah. and they get paid very minuscule yeah. amounts now there's not much you can do mm. you know because they don't have a backstory to tell like a Louis Vuitton or any of these brands mm. have he's a uh, born and brought up learning the how to use the loom he dies using that loom but further to that that's it mm. there's mm. there's no other way to it mm. and now his kids also don't want to come into the same job because the kind of minuscule salaries or pay that they get is not going to suffice for them to lead a better life yeah. so even the artisans don't want their children to come into this field mm. and so a lot of art forms and V forms are dying. However, what happens is there is a cluster that's taken mm -hmm. over. And if those clusters mm -hmm. are given the leeway to play with certain aspects of fabric, mm -hmm. for example, mm -hmm. if an artisan is making just two saris, it's not mm -hmm. really can you get him to make dupattas yeah. or dress materials yeah. or purses or you know and mm. can there be a way where we can experiment with these kind of things with them bring that to life market it correctly mm. i mean the world the sky's the limit so one very important aspect that you touched upon Nita, was the need for design intervention and the right marketing to be able to create those market linkages the other that i would want to ask you is the way uh, the global handicraft story is has been made aspirational. Uh, would you have an opinion on the way the Indian craft story is marketed? Is it is it sympathetic? Is it more about making it about the artisan and making it pitiful rather than making it about the craft being aspirational? Or is it something else about the story that's not right? I think the story of uh, uh, making it sound like uh, it's a poor man's fabric mm. is not aspirational. Yeah. Because, um, you know, we have so much in our heritage. We have so much to st talk about in the culture of India, the weaves mm. of India. I mean, every state <coughs> in our country mm. has a different weave mm. that they specialize in. Mm. Every state has a different way of wearing a sari. Mm, yeah. I mean, it, how diverse are we? Yeah. You know, and here we are, we kind of, even when you have an arts and crafts exhibition, yeah. it's one chota sa khokche me, there is one little guy and he's saying, hamara art le lo, hamara. It's, it's, it's not fair. Yeah. You know, it's, it's just that we are still not developed enough mm. or we are still not dynamic enough to mm. kind of give it its rightful place yeah and uh, by virtue of that i think the minute an international brand speaks about organic and sustainability we want to be the first in the line to buy it yeah i mean look at the queue at, at harrods yeah they say look at the queue yeah. uh, yet when global brands uh, look at indian artisanship and uh, 
leverage that in their products uh the same uh indian craft sells for a very different value uh whether it was dior whether it was any kind of such brand which has been able to look at indian craft in a very different way well that was because it's dior or yeah. it's it's another brand it's an international brand yeah. because they understand the value of what comes to the table mm. with with a craft mm. and they can leverage that craft through their marketing through their communication which we don't mm. and i think uh when we are here when our youngsters are here uh speaking about sustainability speaking about a circular economy i think we need to speak about even our crafts and arts and preserving that culture yeah because that's something that is going to die out very soon i always tell my clients and i might tell my friends your zardozi outfits and sarees and lehengas hold on to it for dear life because another 15 years no. from now they are going to be extinct mm. because there's so much of mechanized embroidery that has come in that you're not going to get handcrafted mm. work if there were three things that you could probably give as a takeaway to the audience on what can they do to be a part of the india craft story if they were to engage with an artisan what are some things that they can take care of in those conversations that can probably uplift the artisan in some way you know uh, we are in a day and age of instagram mm. the least you can do is make awareness through your instagram for them as well because social media is a huge uh, platform today of awareness you know businesses have started just by putting up your um uh, stories and putting up your products on instagram you can do that you can speak about the story today's uh, generation is very craft inclined they want to hear a story about craft mm. so many designers are putting up their um uh, you know their instagram posts is all about the craft stories and i i kind of wonder i mean with so many craft stories in my in my journey i have not put up a single so neetha lola you need to put it out there so that way you can put out um, yeah. certain craft stories that you kind of see mm. uh, in and around your um vicinity mm. um that is something that can uh, can be done through a digital medium yeah. um secondly um creating awareness to your community you know to be able to um have a right price point mm. that has given to the weaver mm. not your uh, the person who is selling you the weaves mm. because the more you can attempt at having lesser middlemen mm. between the weaver so having that b to c as you call it mm. b to b yeah. whatever yeah. i mean um format direct to consumer direct to consumer uh, would have would be a better way of looking at it mm. because today everybody knows what is available where yeah. where, where are the weavers i mean the world has become so small yeah and then yes uh, uh, trying to create more products mm. um through creating a line with the weavers you know mm. especially as designers mm. and we can kind of look at um adopting a whole community mm. um and trying to do what is best yeah. for the weaver but however having said so, so apart from these three points that you asked me about um i just feel that working on the loom mm. is a very tedious process you know where the weaver only can do that much mm. because day and day out day and day out it it is manual mm. i mean we have so many a uh, young kids who are into engineering who are studying mm. machines is there a way whereby we can speed in the mm. process of the loom in a way that it gets slightly mechanized mm. you're not spoiling the organicity of the work mm. and come on even speaking about sustainability how is it helping the yeah. poor weaver yeah. so is there anything that can be done mm. on that aspect mm. because i know a lot of youngsters are speaking about uh environmental cleanliness uh, are coming up with apps on this coming up with uh you know various uh, machines and what have you to be able to 
uh, create sustainable mm. practices, is there a way where we can speed in mm. something for the poor weaver where mm. possibly, you know, because of that, the pace of weaving gets faster, mm. the, uh, they can do more work, they can make more money so that even their coming generation mm. can get into the same profile yeah. of work. So we can, in turn, um, kind of uh, uh, sustain mm. our heritage of weaves. I think one would be creating awareness through your own channels, social channels, like you said. Second yeah. that you mentioned was creating awareness within the community and buying directly from the source instead of through the multiple layers. Absolutely. And the third very important aspect that you talked about was um, the part about trying to bring in technological interventions which can improvise and make it better and efficient for the handlooms and for the weaver community to be able to work faster. I think very important points. Um, I was also thinking about, uh, you know, one thing that we'd probably touched upon uh, in our conversation uh, was the design part where I, I was actually, you know, when we mentioned uh, Jodha Akbar, when we, I was just trying to recall Aishwarya and I do remember you designing her first Khan's look and multiple thereafter. But my question is not about the Khan's look. My question is about uh, the Khan's look back then uh, to how the Khan's look to the Met Gala, to so many other things have evolved in a way where the design sensibilities at a certain point in time were minimal, were elegant, were very different to now it's, it's very loud, it's very different. So what do you see has uh, changed in this whole evolving design space that from a minimal aesthetic to now out loud there, very different. So I think uh, um, awareness of Khan's looks started with Aishwarya's uh, um, Akasari that we did yeah. for her Devdas premiere yes. at Khan's. Um, I don't think there has been a minimalistic look at that point in time. Mm -hmm. Of course, later on, I got a lot of backlash for her looks in Khan's, which of course was uh, a completely different, uh, whatever it was, doesn't matter. Uh, but um, depending on the trend mm. at that point in time, depending on the fashion statement, people wore their clothes. Mm. The awareness happened mm. in India. The awareness was already there outside the country and people started dressing uh, Med Gala was a completely different genre of yeah. clothing, which was avant-garde and uh, Khan's was about uh, OTT glam and yeah. elegant glam. So depending on the person who attended and what time they attended, mm -hmm. the, uh, whether they, was, they were attending a premiere or a preview or a luncheon or you know a dinner party, depending on that, people dressed. And that is something which is very relative to every person and the persona that's mm -hmm. being projected on the red carpet. So it's it's got its own uh, trends. Um, it doesn't it doesn't have a, a kind of a um, definitive look of elegance or OTT. It's it's a mix, mm -hmm. but it's it it creates a trend. I would say. Yeah. And when you look at the forecasts, uh, especially from a trends perspective, what are some things that uh, you definitely make note of? Oh, I always make note of trends. Mm. So uh, people generally ask you, what's your inspiration? Mm. Um, my inspiration can be anything and everything, but my philosophy is different. And for my philosophy to take shape for my coming collection, I keep abreast of trends. So, so there's a notion that, you know, is prevalent that uh, every designer's inspiration changes every season. It doesn't. The designer's philosophy remains intact. Like for me, my philosophy is about uh, creating, um, taking uh, silhouettes from the Edwardian era, mm -hmm. taking colors from the Renaissance era and yet keeping it Indian at heart, mm -hmm. which means there's an Indian sensibility that I bring in through fabrics. My cuts will be Edwardian. Mm -hmm. So that is a philosophy that I work with. That is the underlying of my work. Mm -hmm. But trends, uh, whether 
uh, ball gowns are in fashion or balloon skirts are in fashion or puff sleeves are in fashion mm -hmm. fashion those kind of things i kind of pick up from the forecasts mm -hmm. and then i incorporate it into my collections mm -hmm. so that's where trends come into play and as a designer i think it's very important for you to keep abreast of this yeah to stay in touch with the changing times to stay in touch with what's going on around you you talked about notions uh, that surround designers what are two or three notions that you have seen surrounding you and your design philosophy and your way of working so um that is something i really wouldn't know but the little that i've heard is like there there seems to be an enigma about what i do and you know how i work uh -huh. there seems to be um oh she's very expensive because she does films <laughs> So I really don't know. There was this rumor around Ashwarya's wedding sari being priced at something. Oh, tell me about that. Seventy-five lakhs. I mean, people said two crores, and I think somebody told me like this, and they said so much. And it was a Kanji wedding. I said, come on, yeah. come to Kanji Puram and see how much would that sari be. I mean, are you counting her completely with her jewelry and her endorsement costs and everything? Then tell me. So, yeah, but yeah, the notions. Notions. Yeah, interesting. And what are your nightmares, Nita? Nothing. Like, as a designer, like Nothing. you know, working with people, what do you feel? Oh, my like? biggest nightmare is that if by morning ten o'clock I don't get a call, I say nobody loves me. Am I? Do I have a job? Do I don't have a job? <laughs> so that's my only nightmare. I need to work twenty yeah. hours a day. Yeah. And if I'm not working, then I'm at home painting. Ah, so lovely. That's interesting. You paint for yourself. Yeah. Hmm. Um, we are towards uh, the closing of CXO talks, and this is where the CXO talks ritual hits in. Uh, one which starts with knowing what your ritual is, Nita, as as somebody who's a very passionate designer who's like happy to work twenty four seven just. All in, all out. Uh, what are some of your rituals that keep you centered, calm, and the way you are right now? So, if I have work to do, yeah, I'm centered and calm. Mm. <laughs> That's my ritual. Yeah. But yeah, I wake up in the morning at five. Mm. I have the usual five a.m. I'm a five a.m. club person, mm. and I wake up. I do my uh, meditation, mm. shambhavi, and I. Journalize mm. and I work out. Mm. That's that's my ritual till mm. about seven seven thirty. I'm also a housewife and a mother, and so yeah. if there's no cook, I cook in the morning breakfast. Mm -hmm. I cook food. Yeah, and uh, I'm also a grandmom. So oh wow! So I have a Sunday yeah. grandchildren day yeah. for two three hours at least. Yeah, and. Yeah, that's the routine. I mean, that keeps me centered and grounded. Amazing, and I'm sure that gives keeps you balanced. Gives you very with grandkids. I'm sure that must be quite a time that keeps you revived and just oh, absolutely, absolutely. Get in touch with your inner child as well. Inner child, you don't lose. Yeah. The minute you lost your inner child, you lost everything. Hmm. I mean, if your connect with the now has hmm. to be the inner child. Yeah. Yeah. I would want to also now come to the point where I would want to pass forward the question from the last CXO we had on CXO Talks, which was Aditi Surana. Um, she's a high performance coach who works with CXOs and celebrities. The question that she has for you, Nita, is that when you, at some point in time in life, hit a rock bottom, what were some tools that you used? to rise up to rise up like a phoenix you know as professionals we are time and again hitting rock bottom yeah because there is a lot of insecurities mm -hmm. in our work there are lots of things that happen that should not happen and but they're not in your control mm -hmm. so i mean that way you you hit a lot, lot of rock bottoms yeah. on a day to day mm -hmm. basis But what keeps you centered what keeps you grounded is the fact that 
you need to just take a deep breath and say this too shall pass mm. of course it's very difficult to say this it, yeah. it's like it sounds like book jargon yeah but uh, um either you scream it out you shout it out and you yeah. get out with it or you kind of take a deep breath and say okay not happening not mm. working i have to better this mm. take it with a pinch of salt and take it as a learning curve and better it for yourself mm. so to aditi yes i don't give up easily mm. it shows your spirit shows in thank your you. being uh thank you for being so candid uh now is the time neeta i would want you to pass on the question to the next cx so what would your question be to whoever will be the next cx so my question would be what is the one question that has been left unanswered in your mind mm-hmm. wow that's <laughs> that's quite a baller wow yeah interesting i shall definitely put that question across to the next cxo and thank you for doing this thank uh, you. with that we also have a small um, token of love from cxo talk teams because uh, you've given us your precious time and so much insights from your journey so i would want to bring to you a small token of love and uh, that is from the brand ru veda thank you so much Well, I'm glad I could do this. It yes, was a great conversation so and I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank, thank you for your so time. Much.